Hey there, divers and ocean enthusiasts. Welcome to another exciting interview with yours truly, Benjamin Hadfield from Teach Me to Dive. And today, I have the pleasure of chatting with the one and only Steve Rosenberg, award-winning underwater photographer and travel writer and author of Rosenberg eBooks, Dive and Travel Guides. Now, before we dive into the interview, please subscribe and hit the bell for notifications so you don't miss any of our upcoming interviews. Plus, stick around until the end for a very special announcement that you won't want to miss. Now, as mentioned earlier, Steve has an impressive background in the diving industry, including creating and operating a successful scuba trade show and receiving numerous awards for his photography in international competitions. He is also the founder of Rosenberg eBooks, which produces interactive electronic books focusing on international scuba travel. To date, the company has published four comprehensive dive and travel guides and is working on new products in the Caribbean and Indo-Pacific. Again, my name is Benjamin Hadfield. I'm a technical diving instructor with Teach Me to Dive, connecting divers with quality instructors, dive shops, dive locations, and dive agencies for training. Now, without further ado, let's jump into the interview and learn more about Steve's experience and insights in the diving industry. Welcome, Steve. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for the opportunity. I really appreciate it, Benjamin. Awesome. Steve, let's just jump right into the questions. What inspired you to be a photographer and a travel writer? Well, um, I guess on my, well, it's, it's a long process, but on my first certification dive in Monterey, uh, I took along a 110 Instamatic Kodak camera uh, that was probably about 20 bucks for the camera and threw it in the housing. And I was, I was on my way out to the dive site pushing a uh, dive float and a sea otter climbed up on the raft and just, just demanded to have its picture taken. So I took this 110 camera, uh, made some very creative uh, pictures. They weren't uh, necessarily aesthetically pleasing, but uh, uh, I did get some good results, close-ups of a sea otter. And, and from then, it was just, you know, there's no looking back. I was, that was my first, actually, uh, experience with a camera. But it was uh, wow. Now, I hate to say it, but you're dating yourself a little bit when you say that you had a 110 camera. <laughs> okay, well, I, and then I went out and bought a Nikonis three. So, that, okay. so that's uh, that was the time. <laughs> time. And uh, those so were that, great cameras, though. Absolutely great. I love the rangefinder. Did you ever have the issue of forgetting to take the tra the lens cap off? I on my uh, my wall of shame or my my award wall I do have black lens cap awards uh, multiple so <laughs> the answer is absolutely <laughs> I call those black cat at midnight <laughs> yeah that's what I was shooting I was shooting a black cat at midnight <laughs> yeah. unfortunately some of those the um, the pictures that I took with the lens cap on were some of my best shots they absolutely were. Those were the ones that would have won the international award and the Pulitzer, right? That's right. <laughs> absolutely. So how did you get started in diving? Well, um, my first dive, I was in Hawaii on a family vacation. I was a teenager, young teenager. And my sister's boyfriend said, all right, we're going to get rid of you, kid. Take my scuba tank. Uh, here it is. Just get lost. And so I grabbed it and I was gone for an hour. Uh, and it was absolutely incredible. I came from a swimming family. I actually uh, swam competitively, uh, played water polo. Um, and uh, so I was, the water was you know, second nature to me. And I absolutely loved that dive. I did not get certified until uh, it was probably the uh, mid 70s. Um, and at that time, I've been I have certifications with probably all of the uh, agencies, but that, at that time it was NAWI. And uh, I remember um, we had a young drill sergeant instructor who uh, had us doing ditch and dons in a pool where you take off all your gear, leave it at the bottom, and then uh, she would go down and mess with the gear, and then we'd go back down and, and try to put it back together. It was. Uh, it was lots of fun, but uh, anyway, I, so I, I uh, did get uh, I certified in, in mid seventies, went out, like I said, and, and got the uh, Nikonis three and uh, just absolutely loved it. And I, I just kept taking pictures and 
I uh, got into underwater photography. I was leading uh, lots of uh, dive clubs, organizations in Northern California. And uh, I just found that the uh, the underwater world was spectacular, and it was it was lots of fun, very addictive. Um, so I I started doing things like uh, running photography groups. Um, I I ran a uh, an underwater uh, photography competition that was an on site one that we did in Monterey, uh, where you go out on the weekend, shoot a roll of film, and then it was judged and. And, and you turn those in. So I was well into photography before I got into writing. And my first article uh, was actually for Skin Diver Magazine on the uh, photography competition that we ran in, in Monterey. And uh, when I got into the early 80s, uh, I probably was writing for oh, eight different dive publications, all print publications at the time. Um, and if I can give any advice to anyone about, um, diving is, is to write about things that you know about. And that's, that's what, what I got into. So I was writing about, um, oh, going ab diving, doing the photo competitions. Um, I was actually teaching underwater photography. So I, I wrote about how to, and, um, just to, the important thing was no, uh, know the topic that you're writing about. So you, you want to, it's a lot easier to write about things that you know about. I imagine some of that comes from uh, your other career as a shark as well, <laughs> that uh, being prepared for what you're getting ready to do. Would you think that, would you say that comes into a little bit of it? Well, yeah. And, and actually there, there is an anecdote that I, I should pass along. I was actually in the courtroom one time Um with a in trial and on the record the the judge who i knew pretty well uh asked me how could i dive with sharks and i said your honor uh i find that the the sharks underwater are civil and you know where they're coming from um and it was pretty easy to interact with them unlike the ones in the courtroom so this <laughs> and that that comment was was actually on the record but uh so i i did have the the dual uh the dual career of Sharks in the courtroom and sharks in the water. Absolutely. There's certainly plenty of jokes about courtroom sharks. That's for sure. We'll maybe skip those for another time or I'll no, put them okay. above for, um, that'll be the sections we'll put above the, uh, above us as uh, courtroom shark jokes for you. So well, what sets Rosenberg E dive books and travel guides apart from other travel guides on the market currently? Well, um, when, I, I do the dive guides. I want to see things for myself. Um, I find that they're, they're very thorough. They give um, a lot of visuals, and there's a lot of information in the dive guides on uh, not just uh, the dive sites themselves, but also uh, other things to do at the destination, uh, how to get there, um, and there's there's just a lot of information I think to get people excited about diving in a destination and to give them plenty of information um, so that they can actually research and know what they're getting into at a uh, a dive site when when they go and and get excited about uh, what they're going to see and what they're going to experience. But our our guides are Excellent. very thorough. We have uh, three hundred plus images. We have uh, video uh, embedded video in the guides. And uh, they're uh, very, very extensive. So it's wow. No, they're fantastic, and I've looked at several of them, and I certainly enjoyed them. And I love the detail portion. So, how do you go about researching and gathering the information for your travel guides? Well, um, I like to do it hands on. When we uh, we travel, I uh, actually do the ebooks with an old friend of mine who I started diving with. Oh, uh, when our kids were growing up, and that's got to be thirty some odd years ago. Um, so we were involved in the the underwater photographic side at that time. So we became good friends. But we travel together. We like to go to a destination, uh, just kind of uh, feel our way around find out um, as much as we can initially uh, 
about the destination, getting there. Um, and then I talk to the experts who are the dive guides who are in the water all the time. And when I, uh, I like to go out with them, look at the sites myself, experience them so that um, everything in the guide I have seen and I can verify that uh, uh, when people read the guides and find out about uh, the sites and the information, uh, that they can count on it being accurate because there's there's a lot of information out there that's uh, exaggeration, hype, et cetera. But uh, I think our, our guides are very, very accurate. Now, how in-depth do you go with your dive guides for our viewers? Uh, do you talk about the shore diving, how to get into the shore dives, what time to, to go um, in terms of tide and whatnot? We, um, we do, well, let's see. Um, we get into all of the uh, the information about how deep they are, what they're going to see, the, the configuration of the reef at the site, um, a lot of the marine life, tips on, on shooting uh, underwater photography or video, um, and uh, it's it's a kind of a run through of, of the dive for each individual site. So they, uh, the diver who uses the guide knows what they're going to get into uh, to the extent that, uh, well, maybe this dive, I better take macro or, or be looking for a small subject if, if they're not photographers. Uh, mm-hmm. but the, um, I was going to say that the big f- thing for me is, is that it's uh it's like talking to a friend or family member. I want to give them as much information as, as possible and, and, and make uh, that destination familiar to them so that they can take it with them on their device. And literally, before they jump in on a dive, they can read it. So it's like an extra briefing uh, with extra details, more than the uh, dive masters will go into just before you jump in. That's wonderful. Absolutely. And I, I know that that's something that uh, some of us strive to find that th- there's a lot of divers out there that think the only way to go diving is to fly to um, Hawaii and go to a dive boat and do a dive boat. But there's so many more dives available to them that they just don't know about it. Um, and travel guides like yours make the, those dives so much nicer, so much better, because now even a lesser experience, even if you have just a diver that's advanced open water or even lower than that, now has the ability to go into a dive and understand, okay, here's what this dive site's about. Here's what you're going to uh, get in terms of depth. Here's how uh, you're, what you're planned to see as well. And, and you can try and start developing your dives around that as well, not just by the dive companies, but now by the location. So I love that about your books. Yeah, and, and so, not only uh, that, but it, it does add a lot of um, what to do when you're not diving, what, what the, the other family members that are with you, what they can do. Um, but, uh, oh, for the last, I guess, 30, almost, almost 30 years, um, uh, my daughter and I have been going somewhere every year. So I, I think uh, diving for me is so much like family. So I like to it's it's like I'm sharing with her what information I think my daughter or my friends are going to need for uh, diving in a in an area, generally in a destination or in a specific site. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. Now, how do you balance the technical aspects of diving uh, with the creative aspects of photography? Well, um, I think the best information I can give about becoming a good underwater photographer is becoming a good diver because you really want to know neutral buoyancy. You want to know, uh, you want to be a good enough diver so that you don't have to think about um, surviving while you're trying to focus and being creative on a, uh, with your camera or your, or your video camera. So the, the important thing is becoming as good a diver as you can. That's, that's absolutely primary to becoming a good good photographer so staying alive while diving um and to take the pictures is reasonably important then i i think that's probably probably a good idea (laughs) i think so too so perfect buoyancy perfect trim definitely a good idea as well so uh after speaking with our friend brian carney from sdi tdi his advice to new divers was learn to be a better photographer while diving 
buoyancy. Now, past the perfect buoyancy portion that we talked about and having good trim and understanding the key aspects, what tips would you give to be a better photographer? Well, um, I think you definitely have to have good neutral buoyancy. That's uh, absolutely paramount. I, in, in trying to take a picture, for example, you're going down a wall and looking for uh, a pygmy seahorse which is a very small subject that's, that's in a uh, Gorgonian sea fan hanging off the wall at 100 feet, and there's nothing to stand on. So if, if you don't have good buoyancy, there is no way you can even begin to uh, find the critter, much less you know, stay in one place and try to shoot it. But it's, Fair uh, enough. How about How about things like camera selection? If so, I've got it. I'm a good. I'm a good diver. Uh, I've got good neutral buoyancy. I was smart enough to take a uh, um, a tech fundies from uh, Teach Me to Dive, for example, and and I've uh, got that kind of figured out. So I'm ready to get into photography and pick my first camera. How do I do that? Well, um, I think well, well, certainly uh, companies like Backscatter. Uh, who specialize not only in maintaining cameras, selling cameras, and uh, marketing cameras, but they can they can uh, give you a lot of background on the uh, pluses and cons of different different types of, of cameras. You can get a simple camera, something like a uh, Olympus TG, one of the the tough cameras um, that have uh, terrific uh, capabilities, or you can get a, a DSLR. Uh, but I think that the important thing is, well, for me, is to learn how a camera works. Uh, it's, it's important if you want to be a, a good photographer, uh, you need to know how to get the right exposure. So that requires f-stops, uh, shutter speeds, and film speed or, or sensor uh, speed. And... Uh, determine the interaction of those things and, and how that affects uh, exposures. Because if you, well, I, I'm a, a very strong proponent that you need to get the best possible picture in the camera as possible. And it's, it's, it's not really at the equipment. I think it's, it's more, I'm more of an advocate of it's, uh, it's learning how to, uh, set up pictures, learning an eye, uh, tips on on how to take better pictures uh, that are that are pleasing and dramatic. So, um, I mean, I, I could get into just some of the tips that that I use for uh, for photography. But the, the important thing is that um, you know how a camera works, and uh, it's not really the camera itself. That's the most important thing. At at this point, I I, I started with uh, Nikonis cameras, uh, which are rangefinder and totally uh, manual cameras back in the film days, and so I I really adhere to uh, going with the basics on um, you know shutter speeds and and uh, ISO or sensor. Uh, time that the sensor takes to make an image or um, uh, well it's it, it's just knowing how how it works um, I use a DSLR at this point <clears throat> I was at some point dragged kicking and screaming into using a DSLR after years and years and years of using a rangefinder camera but uh, the, the mirrorless cameras are good. The, um, I love DSLRs, even though they're, as some, some people might think, well, they're, they're a little bit more complicated to use. But um, I think if you understand the basics of photography, it really helps um, after you become the, the competent diver. Um, and the, the equipment, you can get a lot of information uh, for free from from places like uh, Backscatter or your photo clubs or, um, you know, if, if you're involved in an organization uh, that uh, has photo presentations or or uh, groups that uh, uh, 
uh, take pictures, I would ad strongly advise that you get involved and get information from from friends. Word of mouth is is uh, a great way to learn. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's it does, absolutely. So let's get let's kind of di dig in a little bit to the nuts and bolts. So you talked about. Um, viewfinder cameras versus DSLRs. Can you kind of give us an idea? What is a DSLR and uh, why is that special? Well, a DSLR is, it gives you a digital image of the, um, of what you're shooting. So, so you know exactly what it looks like in, in the pioneer days, when I started with range finders, we had no idea what the camera was actually seeing. We were guessing we were using film. So we were limited to 36 shots and uh, I think our, our return rate was sometimes better than other times. Um, if, if we got three or four good images off a roll of 36, that was spectacular. But now you can go down with a, a digital um, camera that, so that you can actually see the image on, the, on a uh, LCD screen on the back of your camera um, so you know what the camera is looking at. So if you then uh, use the appropriate uh, settings and use the proper, proper amount of light from your strobes, you can recreate exactly what that image is that the camera is seeing. Um, so that, I mean, the, the digital cameras have such a, an advantage in that you're, you can literally take an unlimited number of, of images when you go down. So you can, um, you can make minor tweaks as you shoot. You can take multiple images of the same subject. Whereas we used to go down and, and, and take shots and we had no idea what the camera was, was actually seeing. So we were guessing. Um, so we were using framers and for wide angle, we'd use a wide enough a lens that it was so forgiving that uh, if we pointed it in the right direction, it was going to uh, cover the subject that we wanted. No, absolutely. So we talk a little bit about, so DSLR is that um, we have a little bit more control. You talked about the F-stop of that. Um, can you explain a little bit about how depth of field is, um, what that is, and how a shallow depth of field versus a depth of um, broad depth of field, uh, how you would use that and what that really means to the photographer? Sure. As uh, when you use a high F-stop, which is a smaller, it's, it's just a smaller hole in the lens. So that's your aperture. Mm -hmm. uh, the smaller the hole, the wider the depth of field. And depth of field measured, um, I guess it's it, from you and then away from you, there's, there's an area that's in focus. And that's, that's your depth of field. If you're using a, um, a limited depth of field, which would be a, a wider aperture, um, it, it's tougher to get everything in focus. So if you're using a, a really wide depth of field, for example, if you're using a, a wide angle uh, lens that gives you a depth of field of several feet or, or even several yards, uh, it's a lot easier to get the entire subject in focus. So if you're taking a picture of uh, well, a whale, for example, and the the depth of field is 30 feet, um, it's very easy to get the entire subject in focus. If you're taking macro shots where the depth of field becomes very critical, and it could be that the depth of field is like an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch wide, uh, you want to make sure that you get the important uh, parts of your subject in focus, uh, like the eyes of a shrimp or uh, the eyes of a fish. You want to make sure that the important things that people are going to be focusing on or looking at um, are crisp and in, in focus. And if they're outside of that depth of field, they're not going to be in focus. So the only uh, area, if you will, that is in focus is the... Um, is whatever falls within your depth of field. I don't, I don't know if that, uh, that's clear, but. So how do you choose the depth, uh, where to put the depth of field? Or for example, how do you choose to make sh make a very narrow depth of field where just a little bit of the, fo the photo is in focus versus a lot of the photo in focus? Well, um, it's, uh, if you're close up, you can, um, you certainly want to, 
well, let's, let's go to your subject first. If you're, if you're taking a picture of a fish, um, you want to make sure that the important parts of that fish are in focus. And that could be the mouth, that could be the eyes, it could be the area from the tip of the nose to the eyes. And the, whether or not the rest of the fish is in focus is really not as important because people are going to look at that picture and they're going to look at the uh, naturally look at the the mouth and the teeth and the and the eyes to see if that part is in focus. So you want to make sure that your depth of field uh, is centered around those important uh, uh, parts of your subject. Awesome. No, that's great. So now there's got to be a relationship to the shutter speed. If we're um, reducing the amount of light that can come in because we're shooting a very fast subject with a very narrow depth of field, what does that do to our shutter speed? Okay. Um, if you're shooting on manual, so you're if you shoot your, um, well, if the shutter speed is slower, uh, you can get use a a smaller aperture and a, thereby get a wider depth of field uh, to get the same exposure. So if you're looking at uh, maintaining a, uh, a proper exposure on a picture, if you use a, uh, well, the faster the shutter speed you use, the less light that is going to be entering uh, the lens. So, um, if you use a smaller aperture as opposed to a large aperture, the less light that's going to be entering the lens. So what you have to do is kind of decide, well, how much light do I need? Um, am I using natural light? Am I using my strobe light? Um, so it's, it's kind of like deciding how much is, how much, um, light is necessary for a given picture. So you have the proximity of the strobe itself to the subject. Because if you take a strobe that's like one half or say one foot from the subject as opposed to two feet, you're going to get one stop difference. And this might be too technical. But the um, if you use a shutter speed that's one sixtieth of a second of a second as opposed to um, say one one twenty fifth of a second, it's going to be uh, twice as much light with one sixtieth of a second as one one twenty fifth. Um, so the the smaller the the aperture, uh, the less light it's going to be able to enter your camera. If you're using a shutter speed, the uh, the slower the shutter speed, the more light that's going to, going to enter the camera for an exposure. Um, I would imagine that's got to have a huge effect with uh, with your buoyancy factor, the fact that you're in a current, your things are moving, you're moving, the ocean's moving. So all of a sudden you have three things moving and with a slower shutter speed, it must add a little bit more challenge to the photo itself. That's correct. Um, so you, you want to try to get um, to use a shutter speed that's going to catch uh, the subject uh, Usually, your 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 goal is to catch it so that there's no motion, so that it's crisp. Uh, but if you're using a strobe and you're relying on a strobe light, um, the uh, the speed of the strobe is so fast that that's going to stop action also. So it's it's all interrelated. Um, this is this is probably the subject of two or three. Uh, sessions of, of a photo course, but it's, um, the, the important thing to remember is that the, um, the flash of the strobe, the, uh, speed of the, the shutter, the, uh, opening in the aperture or the center of the lens, all of those things affect the amount of light that's going to give you an exposure of a picture. So, um, Next. It's it's something that um, it's it's easy to to take an hour or two uh, to show the differences on on how they interrelate, but they're they're all uh, interrelated as far as getting the proper exposure of a picture. And let me um, segue to say that uh, it is in my mind very important to get 
still to get the best possible picture out of your camera without trying to make the camera in your computer. Um, it, it's certainly possible to improve shots by putting them through, through uh, Photoshop or, or Aperture or any number of the, uh, 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 the programs that are available. Before. So have a good photo works is better than uh, uh, makes a better photo as it goes through photo processing. That sounds so odd. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Starting with a good product first. Wait, wait, that's you're revolutionary here. Stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I get it completely. So um, I think that really comes back to that's some great information as well. And I appreciate you digging into that a little bit for the viewers. And the, the key portion is is there's a lot of really key portions of your camera that you need to understand and going through an A, understanding your camera and how it works and then taking a fo qualified photo course um, from somebody who understands those pieces definitely is to your advantage to make sure that you're utilizing all the advanced features as best you can. Would that be fair? Absolutely. Perfect. Well, let's kind of move on. So you've been everywhere. What's been some of your favorite diving destinations and why? Well, um, I would say my absolute favorite dive destination is the Galapagos Islands. And I've been fortunate enough to been there a long time at, at this point. I've, I've got probably 600 plus dives in the Galapagos. Um, wow. My, my first uh, couple of dive masters, I think, in the Galapagos were very important to me and have become actually close friends over the years. Uh, my first dive in the Galapagos Islands was in, oh, I'd say 1993 aboard uh, the Aggressor. And my dive guide was uh, Matias Espinoza, who was just a, a terrific guy who, um, who knows um, behaviors. He knows, um, he, he's a naturalist guide. So it, it used to be that all of the dive masters in the Galapagos had to be, um, had to have a degree in, in uh, uh, the, uh, not only the above water, but below water uh, marine life and, and things that you're gonna see in the Galapagos. But um, I was able to um, sit down with them, well, I, I think you, you asked me what was my favorite destination. Well, that was that's certainly one of them. Uh, Galapagos Islands, I can espouse on on, on other aspects later, but um, it is excitement. It's there's just overwhelming uh, numbers of subjects to take pictures of. It's and it's not just uh, below water. It's above water. There's the tours are incredible. Um, it's uh, on any dive in the Northern Islands, uh, you can go out and look for a whale shark and you're, you're passing schools of scalloped hammerheads, dolphins, um, Galapagos sharks, turtles, you know, and you, you're just pushing them out of the way so you can get to the, uh, you know, your uh, goal of, of finding the whale shark or, or heading out to the whale sharks so you can get pictures of them. But, but there is so much that it's, it's overwhelming. Uh, so that's certainly one of my favorite destinations. I would say, um, as far as sharks, for example, Tiger Beach is is incredible. Uh, if you have the opportunity to dive with uh, Jim Abernethy uh, on the Shearwater, I think I think he's still going out of Palm Beach, but uh, uh, Tiger Beach is incredible. It's it's a um, a location in the northern Bahamas. Uh, that will give you plenty of up close and personal experience with uh, tiger sharks, uh, lemon sharks, Caribbean reef sharks, uh, nurse sharks. You, you name it. It's that's that's it's uh, it's an incredible place. Um, but I would I would also say that uh, I think probably my most favorite favorite uh, dive destination is where I happen to be at the moment. Because there's every, everything has as incredible stuff to offer. I my experience initially was with Northern California, and I probably spent a thousand dives in uh, up and down Northern California, and and doing um, oh hunting, uh, ab diving, um, 
just uh, all of the sites. And uh, it, uh, the more you, you learn about behavior, uh, and this, this actually helps out with photography also, um, because the more you learn about what you're going to see underwater, for example, the behavior of animals, it's, it makes it a lot easier to photograph those animals um, because it allows you to the, uh, the ability to get close and you don't have to chase them down. You can kind of anticipate where they're going to be um, and uh, kind of set yourself up so that they can almost come to you so that you can take shots kind of from segueing again. But uh, um, so I would, I would say a lot of it is, is where you are. Um, and there's, there's spectacular um, aspects of, of almost any destination. Um, you mentioned Hawaii. That's great. The Philippines are incredible. Um, the, uh, oh, the Palau is, is fantastic. Just absolutely love the 70 islands and, and uh, shark corner. And I mean, there's, there's aspects of any dive destination that uh, make that dive destination worthwhile, which, which also leads me back to, well, if you have a, a dive, uh, a dive guide that uh, you can take with you, <laughs> it, it really makes the, uh, uh, what you're going to see, you know, it gives you a lot, a lot more information and makes it more worthwhile. Sure. A little planning goes a long way to figure out and make sure you're taking advantage of everything you want to see or could see here, there, uh, and uh, with a little surprise on it as well. So what was the most surprising thing you had during your travels? Most surprising thing during my travels? Um, I think I have uh, actually run into so many things that I had not anticipated when I, when I go out and uh, – and shoot. Um, hmm. I I've, I've really been blessed to see so many things. That that's a difficult question. Um, I think almost any. I would say at least once in every dive, I'm gonna I'm gonna look up and and go. Oh wow! There's there's a a bearded toadfish or, um, you know. Oh, that's, that's there's a tiger shark about two feet away from me that's coming out of a out of the, uh, the gloom on a night dive. Or, uh, there's uh, there's there's always that's the the great thing about diving is that there's always something surprising, always something new uh, that you really don't anticipate. And but you just got to be open to it. You got to be aware of your surroundings. Uh, yeah, it's it's really really spectacular. So I would say there's awesome. there's, there's something new everywhere, something some surprise that you don't anticipate. The answer is everywhere. I like it. Um, how do you believe technology has changed the field of underwater photography and travel writing over the years? Well, um, hmm, that's that's tough. It used to be, um, it's especially when I was, when I was doing a lot of writing for, um, print magazines, that it was very, it was very profitable. I think, uh, diving has become very expensive. Um, you probably have to pick and choose. Uh, I think going to, um, to areas that are, are not as, as expensive, but, still hold the uh, the prospect of of having tremendous in interactions um my the, the place of, of my first warm water diving which was Cozumel uh back in well geez 78 um it uh and I, again I'm, I'm segueing um I, I think that the, the equipment has changed significantly. Uh, in a lot of ways, it has uh, made it easier to take pictures, but not necessarily great pictures. It still, um, it still becomes 
important on the for the photographer, whether the photographer is thinking in a creative sense, whether the um, photographer is just relying on the equipment to take good pictures. I think with the the advent of the internet um, and digital aspects of photography, it makes a lot of uh, photographers pretty good photographers. And it has changed um, the the number of books and magazines that are in your hands to the internet to online information. Um, it's I think so. So it's it's easier to be to um, take reasonably good uh, pictures. A lot of people rely on. Uh, or, or a lot of people are looking at just having their pretty good pictures um, in publications, which are online publications now, and they don't pay as much. So I, I think one of the big uh, things is there is the technology that makes it easier to take pictures, but uh, it's become much more expensive. So, and to, I think to actually make a, a living with um, writing, travel writing, and being an underwater photography is is more difficult. It's uh, I think uh, you have to build relationships, which is is still important. With, with some of the new online uh, publications, um, that will certainly get you in the door as far as um, notoriety, as far as uh, getting your name out, uh, but it's not necessarily uh, lucrative. So it's, it's, it's somewhat harder to, uh, I think, make a living at underwater photography. So you probably, or, or writing, travel writing, um, there, there still are some uh, publications that uh, pay pretty well and certainly will help uh, photographers on going to destinations so that they, they write about those destinations. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question exactly, but it's, uh, there's, there's some good things, there's some bad things. It's, it's easier to, um, I think, come out of the water with a lot better results because you're seeing um, what uh, the results are in the camera to a great extent rather than waiting for the film to be processed. So you're, you're actually seeing some of your results underwater. I think it's, it's extremely important to when you're starting out to uh, write about things that you, you know about. If you're an instructor, um, write about the experiences uh, that you have um, in your um, scuba classes. Um, you can certainly, it certainly lends itself to uh, some levity as, as far as some of the things that instructors have seen. Uh, but, the, but the important thing is, is writing things that uh, you know about it's building relationships uh, in the, the dive industry. Um, and if I can give anybody advice as far as um, strengthening relationships with publishers and uh, people who are in a, a position to help you out is to give back so that they know that they can rely on you is to, to work your tail off uh, and just go the extra mile, see what you can do for them so that they'll, um, they'll count on you as a, uh, a possible new writer, photographer for their niche. And speaking of niches, I, th I think it's really important to build a um, uh, kind of strengths in a particular niche. Uh, you, you can't write about everything and, and I think succeed. 
um, even though some of us have, have tried over the years. Um, again, I don't, I don't know if that's kind of answering. Yeah, that helps no, you absolutely, absolutely answered it. And so what do you hope readers and travelers would take away from your dive guides? I hope that uh, readers understand that uh, when they pick up one of my dive guides, and, and I actually work with, with teams, because I, I have a, uh, a good friend that I m mentioned earlier uh, who now lives in Switzerland. Well, we, we actually put the ebooks together, the idea in 2013. And um, we work very hard at making the dive guides readable. We make them thorough. Uh, we try to really um, think about what the the reader is wants to get from the uh, the dive guide. It, um, I, I think it's important, certainly, to focus on the the dive sites themselves. And then, as we talked about earlier, it's it's nice to have those information. Is this a novice dive? Is this an advanced dive? Are they going to hit currents? What is the maximum depth? Um, what type of, of critters are they going to run into? Uh, is there something special that they should look for at that dive site? So it's um, initially focusing on the dive itself uh, or on the different sites. And we picked the most popular dive sites uh, in a given destination, uh, but we also talk about what what else they can get from a um, from traveling to a destination. So it's got to be thorough. It's got to give them the information certainly that they need about diving. It gives them information, um, other information on what else they can do while they're at the destination. Um, it gives them some of the history and some of the I mean just the the nuts and bolts about what this. Uh, destination was about and how it how it got a name and um, how long it's been been around um, how to get there how to get around um, it's, it's just to to let the reader know that when they pick up one of our guides it's going to be so thorough they're going to get enough information to get them in get the the 110 percent value out of going to that destination uh, and we even throw in a marine life section in our our guide so that they they know the 80 or 120 uh critters that are really interesting unique and, and that they should should search out and where to find them so it's it's just an overall uh experience and they know that um the the information is accurate no, that's great. And that's uh, that's what we'd exactly hope for. So we're at that point. So what future projects do you have in the works and what can we expect from Rosenberg eBooks in the future? Well, we're all, always looking for new destinations. Uh, I just finished a, um, a piece that will be in the, uh, the summer issue of Alert Diver uh, on Turks and Caicos. Uh, I'm Next month, we'll be heading off to Tobago, where I've never been, but uh, I've heard good things about. So I'll be doing a, uh, a fall uh, piece for Alert Diver on Tobago. Um, in, the, in September, I'll be going back to um, the Cayman Islands uh, to, well, right now we have a, a book on Grand Cayman. And we're going to be expanding the coverage of that book to include uh, Little Cayman and Cayman Brack. Uh, so we're going to spend uh, some time doing that and updating uh, the information that's uh, that's in the guide already about uh, Grand Cayman. And boy, the, the big the big problem that we've run into is this this little uh, two year hiatus that a lot of people took and a lot of destinations took. Um, without getting into the politics. Um, so it's made a lot of changes. So right now I'm going back and looking, I, I just finished updating my, uh, my Galapagos uh, guide, which uh, not only is my favorite place, it's probably one of the guides that I'm, I'm really most proud of. Um, won a really nice award for, for that guide in 2017 uh, from uh North American Travel Journalists Association. It was it got a gold medal as the best travel guide of any type in the world in 2017. So, wow. so we've we've kept that 
that updated and um, it was just released a few months ago. Um, but uh, there's just, uh, I think, uh, a myriad of things about, about the destinations that you you got to include. I want I want the reader to know that they can count on on our books. But we're also looking at uh, new destinations, possibly the Philippines next year. Uh, I've been talking to them for a while, and and the Philippines has an incredible assortment of of diving, from um, muck diving to um, lush reefs to blackwater diving. Um, uh, Mike Bardic is is one of the the pioneers of uh of blackwater diving up in Analau. and uh I mean, it's, it's things like that where you where you put in the specifics and uh let people go go visit the guys that really know and the, the gals who really know what they're doing um but let's see what else is in the works i'd like to uh do a few more South Pacific destinations uh, coming up um, over the, the course of the pandemic. The last two years, we did get a uh, uh, another guide out on Turks and Caicos, um, which was a lot of fun. It was a, it was a little arduous as far as uh, getting the the actual driving in uh, the the traveling in, uh, but uh, again, a, a very thorough guide, and and that's. Uh, uh, that was a lot of fun putting together. And uh, nice. Turks and Caicos are are it's it's just a, a destination that's always been fun for me because it was where my daughter uh, was certified when she was twelve, um, and uh, I had I had a good friend who was the the first captain and and owner of the Galapagos Aggressor in Turks and Caicos. And it was like, I took her down there and, and he threw an Easter egg hunt for her at, at one of the sites. And she was just a, a tremendous friend. And I, uh, I, I think something that uh, you, you deal with, with training, I believe, and, and getting uh, people that are getting into diving. And I think one of the really tremendous things about scuba diving is it's, uh, it's really for friends, developing friends, and and interactions with family. It's uh, it's a fantastic sport and activity where you can build lasting relationships. And uh, I've been very blessed in in having uh, so many very good friends that I've uh, formed uh, relationships with over the past, and and being able to travel with my daughter every year for someplace um uh, it's, it's just been terrific that's wonderful so you've got a, a, an offer for us today you've got a free download i i understand can you tell us about that yes absolutely uh we have a um one of our our ebook dive guides uh dive and travel cozumel which is available from amazon itunes and google play and uh you can either go to those sites right now, uh, your followers, and get a free download of that dive guide, or you can go to our website, which is just uh, www.divetravelguides.com. Uh, so www.divetravelguides.com. And there's, there's links to um, get a free download of that book from all three of the main platforms. And uh, that will be open uh, during the month of May. So if, if uh, they want to go uh, get a copy and see what we're doing, uh, we'd love to have them download a copy. Awesome. We'll make sure that happens. Well, Steve, thank you for taking the time with us today um, and in doing an in-depth interview, talking about all the things we talked about, how to how to take better pictures, where you've been and your favorite destinations. I did like the uh, the idea that my favorite destination is our dive is the one I'm on right now. Absolutely. That's uh, um, that's a common theme I've heard among divers, and it's it, I have to say it's mine too. There are a few, though, that I've been on that I wished it was a different dive, but it is what it is. I'd rather be bubbling bubbles than doing anything else. Absolutely. Well, Steve, thank you.
time. Great interview. Um, definitely want to make sure for everybody's watching and listening, make sure to go to dive travel guides.com. Um, subscribe and make sure to okay. download his travel guide. travel guide this month. So sweet deal. Steve, thank you again and have a wonderful day. Well, Benjamin, it's been a pleasure and you too. God bless, man.